So how many of you have embarked on a project, uh, whether it be home improvement or uh, cooking, and you've gathered all your materials or your ingredients together, and you did a lot of research, and uh, you're, you're starting to embark on this project, you get about halfway through it, and it's like, wow, this is a lot different than I thought it was going to be. Any of you? Show of hands. Any of you? Huh? Okay, very good. That's what the way this sermon was this week, okay? Uh, so the insert in your bulletin is helpful, but not really, and uh, hopefully the PowerPoint will be a little bit more helpful, but um, as I prayed, I just hope that in spite of it all, you hear the Lord speaking to you today. I'm going to start by doing a little word association. I'm going to say a word, and you're going to shout the first word that comes to your mind. <laughs> okay, for a little... All right, those two are not really the right words, okay? Those are not the right answers. All right. Um, friendly. No, no, that's not the right word either. Friendly. Okay. Optimistic. A glass. Okay, yeah, right. Half full. Very good. Uh, any others? Optimistic? Happy? Okay, very good. How about zealous? Okay. All right. Some people want, ooh, ooh, zealous. Ooh. And zealous certainly has negative connotations in our society. We can all think of negative examples of zeal, can't we? I can think of one. When I was a student at the Ohio State University, yeah, see now some of you are like, oh, he's zealous for that right there. When I was a student at the Ohio State University, um, there was an itinerant rabble rouser who used to travel from Big Ten campus to Big Ten campus. Now he'd have a lot more campuses to cover, but never mind. Um, and uh, he would try to, he would find the most open area of campus and he would yell epithets at all the students until he gathered a crowd of kind of surly, sneering students. And he gathered his crowd together and he began to explain in vile, explicit detail all of the sins that college students committed. And he would point his finger at them and he would say, you will burn forever in the lake of fire. Not once did he mention redemption in Christ. Not once did he mention forgiveness of sin. It's just all the time. You will burn forever. He was zealous, but not for good cause. Galatians 4.18 says, It is fine to be zealous, provided that the purpose is good, and to be so always, and not just when I'm with you. Zeal is a good thing. King David, as you know, was very zealous for the honor and glory and worship of God. At one point early in his reign, he brought the Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem. That was a, an incredible thing. The Ark of the Covenant had been captured by the Philistines and then was just in somebody's barn for a long time. And, and they finally found it and they, they rebuilt the tabernacle of God and they brought the Ark of the Covenant back up to Jerusalem where it belonged in the first place. And you can imagine, David was so excited. He was so excited that he did something that no king should ever do. He took off his royal robes and he set them down and he just began to dance. Just began to dance like some common person. Just began to dance excitedly, exuberantly, sweat pouring down. He just began to dance before the Ark of the Covenant. And he didn't do it like just for the photo op, you know. He did it. He did it for miles and miles. And his wife, who was given to him as a snare by uh, King Saul, um, she, she ridiculed him. She saw him dancing, and, and the story in the Old Testament says that she despised him. But, but David didn't stop dancing. It was before the Lord who appointed me ruler over the Lord's people, Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this 
and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. That's 2 Samuel chapter 16. I encourage you to read it because he said a lot more that's kind of funny but not pertinent to the points today. So the honest gratitude, you know, yeah, you're like uh, two slides ahead. You're doing great. You're efficient, but you're ahead of me. Um, the honest gratitude that King David had in his heart became exuberance, which David chose to express, even though it meant casting aside his pride. David was zealous for the glory of his king. What can zeal motivate you to do? If I am zealous for a cause, at what will I stop in order to promote that cause? Nothing. Thank you very much. I will stop at nothing. I will be unstoppable. Now, I know that zeal still will have a negative connotation for some of you. So it's so closely linked to fanaticism in our society. So let's explore two other words for zeal, which uh, are used in the definition of zeal in Romans chapter 12, verse 11. The first word is diligence, as you already saw on the screen. Diligence. Proverbs 10.4 says, lazy hands make a man poor, but diligent hands bring wealth. This is so true in life. It might seem too practical to be inspirational, but if you want to succeed, do you slack off? Should you decry the injustice of a system that ignores the good things you have already done and just sit on your hands until your past achievements have been recognized? <laughs> Should you do nothing and expect to be served success on a silver platter? No! No! A thousand times, children! No! You must work. Labor, toil, get down lower so you can get more of your shoulder into it. And this isn't just true for material wealth. A lot of us are spiritually impoverished because we do not avail ourselves of the riches of the scripture and a relationship with God. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Be diligent, study, work hard to present yourself approved to God a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. God loves you. And God cares about you more than you will ever know. More than you will ever even love or care for yourself. God has written a script for your success. And God longs to see you join in that script and see him at work. But you can't do nothing and expect him to move on you. I can't expect the word of God to dwell in me richly if I never crack open my Bible. I can't expect God to just do something that I'm not willing to do uh, to, to begin as it pertains to my life. So I have a hard-hitting question for you. If you approached getting a job the same way you approached getting to know Jesus, do you think you'd ever get through the first interview? That challenged me as I thought about that today, this week. Now let's substitute the word diligence for zeal and read Romans 12, 11 again. Ready? Never be lacking in... Let's all read it together. Ready? Never be lacking in diligence, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. The second word of zeal is passion. Now to me, passionate people are inspiring they love what they are called to do, and they do it with diligence, veracity, energy, and usually joy. The Apostle Paul was a passionate man who also strove to be under the control of the Holy Spirit. The end of this month, October 30th, is Reformation Day. 
That means that next Sunday is Reformation Sunday, and the odds are pretty good that at some point in the service, probably at the beginning, we will sing some form of Martin Luther's great hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Luther was certainly a man of passion. He was willing to confront the power structures of his day and challenge the institution which called itself the church to reform itself from corruption, hypocrisy, and layers of unnecessary traditions and superstitions. Here I stand, he declared, even though he knew it would cost everything he held dear. Passion. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Let's read Romans 12, 11 with passion instead of zeal. Ready? Never be lacking in passion, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Uh, I ran across a couple weeks ago a quip from Halford Lucock. He was a famous Methodist preacher in his day and a homiletics professor. I believe at Yale Divinity School. This is not a picture of uh, Alfred Lucock. This is instead is a picture of Eugene Ormandy, the great symphony conductor. Lucock uh, said he ran across a story in which uh, he read that Eugene Ormandy, the great symphony conductor, actually dislocated a shoulder while he was conducting one of his symphony pieces. He certainly gave it his all, Lukacs said. And I sit here and I wonder, in my service of God, have I ever dislocated anything, even a necktie? Diligence, passion, and of course, unstoppability. Now, a lot of times when I think of the word fervor, keep your spiritual fervor, I think of the word fever. Uh, nobody thinks like me, I know, so oh, you're going, what, what, what? But actually, that's, that's good for this passage um, because it has to do with a, a bubbling up. Now, I love pasta. It helped make me the man that I am today. And I love cooking pasta. It's so easy. You just dump the pasta in the pot of water and you put it on the stove. No, thank you very much. Okay, now obviously some of you need to be taking notes right here at this point in the sermon. All right, so you put the water on the stove and you put heat under it. And as soon as there's heat under the water, you dump the pasta in and you're good, right? No, okay, good, more you're with me. What do you have to do? You have to boil the water, salt might help, but you have to boil the water. Okay, so my wife is like, that proverb about, proverb about a watch pot never boiled, it was written, a watch pot never boils. It was written for you. Because I'm always like around the stove, lifting up the lid, is the water boiling yet? It's steaming, can I dump it in? I'm hungry. No. There, 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 there are little bubbles in the bottom of the pot. Can I dump the pasta in now? Try stirring. So I stir the pot, and the bubbles, of course, they disappear. You have to wait till there are big bubbles in the bottom of the pot bubbling up. Then the water is ready for you to put the pasta in. It has to bubble. There has to be a fervor in the water before you can dump the pasta in. Now, Jesus says that those who drink his water of life, which is not boiling, by the way, those who drink his water of life, out of them will bubble a spring of life. And just like any other spring, it's not just good for that person for you, if you have that spring of life in you, but it's also good for those around you as that spring bubbles out of you and nourishes and refreshes those with whom you come in contact. Like a fire, zeal needs to be guarded, fed, protected, and fanned, or it will burn out. So I started thinking about how to keep zeal alive in my life. And I thought about stuff that takes zeal out. The zeal zappers. Creative, huh? Come on, come on. 
There are a bunch, uh, but I'm going to just name a few that I identified in my life. Now, this might not be true for your life. You don't need to feverishly write these down necessarily. But if something occurs to you as I'm talking that's a zeal zapper in your life, maybe you want to write that down. But maybe you'll resonate with some of these. So the first thing that I need to do to keep zeal alive in my life is I need to guard my heart against zeal zappers, such as... The bad behavior and poor conduct and words of others, especially other Christians. Not seeing the results I expected to see. Failing to seek God's direction in the face of opposition. Giving up too quickly in prayer. Some of those are way beyond my control. And some of those are things that I might have something to do with. But either way, these things kind of zap my zeal. Maybe you can think of other things for you. I need to guard my heart against things like that. Another thing I need to do is say yes to the ministry of the Holy Spirit in my life. Not only can we have a ministry of serving Him, But he ministers to us. Think of this. The one who is called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God. Everlasting Father. The Prince of Peace. He has given you his spirit to live inside you. The Holy Spirit isn't some mystical force. He is God. And he lives within everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus to be saved. God is the strength of my life and my portion forever. But we run away from him in our lives and we turn to other sources of strength. We want to feel strong, so we pursue youthfulness Virility, fitness, relevance, relationships, whether they're healthy or not. Anything that can speak to us and say, I matter. And we fill our life with noise and trivia and constant activity when what we need to do is stop. And so the last thing that I can do of my three things to keep zeal alive in my life is to cleanse my heart from idols and impurities. I need to stop and worship God. Stop and hear his still, small voice inside me. A voice from the one who once calmed the storms of the Sea of Galilee. A voice that is singing over you right now. A voice that is saying, you matter. You are made in my image. I gave my life for you. And I am preparing for you a place of such joy and beauty that you can't even imagine it. Do not lack in unstoppable diligence and passion, but keep it bubbling up in your spirit, serving the Lord. Now, for me, the key to not lacking in diligent, unstoppable passion, the key to keeping the spring bubbling up in my life can be found in the phrase, serving the Lord. Say, serving the Lord. Lord. It's more than doing activity. I hope you understand that. It's more than just working for him. Because when you know a boss, you begin to anticipate what he wants from you, and you begin to do things just because you know what he may want. But through Jesus, you're not just a servant. You're not just an employee. Jesus calls you friend. So ideally, you're not serving out of duty or drudgery. You're serving because Jesus first loved you and invites you to join him in his work. So Christian serving is grounded in relationship. It's serving the Lord, not serving me and what I want. 
It's not serving the church. It's not serving the world. It's not serving you. It's serving the Lord. Now that does not mean that the church won't be served. That does not mean that you won't be served. It doesn't mean that I don't love you or the church or myself for that matter. But when I have everything in balance, I serve the Lord. And I want to serve the Lord in such a way that brings him pleasure. As I studied this, this concept of zeal, I ran across a character from church history, American church history, that the more I read about him, the more fascinated I was. He was a young circuit-riding preacher, riding circuits in the early 1800s that took him through Illinois, Tennessee, and Kentucky when they were considered Wild West frontiers. He rode a horse, and when he was lucky, he got to sleep in a tent. I need to amend my remarks at this point and say I shook hands with Carolyn Sloan at the end of uh, uh, the service uh, at 8.30, and she said that this man, sometimes when he came riding around that part of uh, Illinois, stayed in the home of her great-grandmother. That's how notorious or famous this guy was. It's passed down through her generation. She recognized his name as soon as I said it, but I'm not going to say his name yet. He wasn't afraid of disruptive drunks or gangs of rowdy young men. And he could argue his case to learned doctors of medicine and law. He began preaching at age 18, and by the age of 23, Bishop Francis Asbury ordained him as a full elder of the Methodist Episcopal Church. Now, in the decades leading up to the Civil War, the Methodist Episcopal Church was divided over the issue of slavery. The Methodist Book of Discipline spoke of slavery as a great evil and forbade clergy from owning slaves or taking part in slave trade. But when a bishop from Georgia was actually required to free his household slaves, this part of the discipline began to become quite unpopular. And while the words of the discipline were never changed, its enforcement was abandoned, <clears throat> leading to the splitting of the Methodist Episcopal Church and the Methodist Episcopal Church South. One year at the Methodist Conference in Nashville, Tennessee, this young circuit-riding preacher named Peter Cartwright was asked to preach. You see his picture up here on the screen. Rough, rugged man, broad shoulders, probably could be a linebacker or something like that. I've been trying to get my hair like that for years, but anyway, so is Pastor Richard, but that's another story. Um, be sure to tell him I mentioned him in my sermon, okay? Uh, he was asked to preach in Nashville, and it was really a bone that the leadership of the conference through to a small group of conservative pastors who felt like they were being snubbed. The meeting was off-site and optional. He was advised to speak gently in a way that might unify the people and not inflame them. Well, the host pastor of the downtown church that was holding this off-site optional meeting, he was pretty nervous. He loved his position as one of the uh, as the pastor of one of the churches of the fashionable elite. As the large sanctuary filled with people, Peter Cartwright and this pastor peered around the pulpit at the gathering crowd who came to hear this firebrand preacher. He was, after all, raised in Virginia and Kentucky, and he often rode down to preach in Tennessee. He was one of their own, so he must have something to say. Hymns were sung and prayers were prayed, and you could feel the anticipation build in the room with every passing moment and as with every person that crammed themselves more and more into the sanctuary. 
Presently, the young yet very old-fashioned Peter Cartwright made his way up the stairs of the pulpit in this Methodist tabernacle, the admonitions of the pastor to play it safe still ringing in his ear. At that moment, General Andrew Jackson strode in. For all his faults, he was a gallant man, and he made nobody give up his seat. He simply walked to the middle of the sanctuary and leaned himself on a post to listen to the sermon. As you can imagine, the host pastor was beside himself. He was tugging on Peter's sleeve up in the pulpit saying, General, Andrew Jackson is here. Andrew Jackson is here. Who is Andrew Jackson? Peter's voice thundered from the mass of pulpit. I tell you today, if he doesn't repent... He will burn in hell like any other sinner. (laughs) The pastor cowered back in his seat and pulled his collar up to his ears. The next day, he went to Andrew Jackson's hotel room to apologize for the words of, of his brash guest speaker. General Jackson replied that he admired the rough circuit rider for his independence and said that any pastor ought to love everyone and fear no mortal man. He said if he had officers like Peter Cartwright to train his soldiers, he thought he could take out old England again. Peter Cartwright lived by his convictions. Moving from Kentucky to Illinois to make sure none of his five daughters fell in love with a slave owner. He was an outspoken voice insisting that the rule of the discipline be enforced and that those who disagree should form their own denomination and plant their own churches and leave the Methodist Episcopal Church intact instead of splitting south and north. Then, he argued, the church could minister to and eventually change the hearts of the slave owners as well as see their slaves nurtured in faith in Christ and supported when they were finally freed. Even though things didn't turn out the way he desired, he shouldered on compassionately, but without compromise. Mister, we could use men and women like Peter Cartwright again. Maybe some of them are here in this sanctuary. Zeal, fervor, serving the Lord. Rise up, O saints of God. Have done with lesser things. Give heart and mind and soul and strength to serve the King of Kings. We don't know what was going through Peter Cartwright's mind at the moment that he called General Jackson out. But perhaps the words of the psalm that I read earlier, Psalm 73, came to him. In the beginning of that psalm, King David admits that he became envious of those who didn't do right but seemed to get away with it. They disobeyed God, and yet they were rich and didn't seem to have a care in the world. He admitted that it nearly made him crazy, but then he stood in the sanctuary of God and bam! He understood their final destiny. You see, we want to live this life to the fullest, to the glory of God. But this life is not the end. Nor is my strength the only thing on which I have to rely. My flesh and my heart may fail. Let's say the rest of this together. But God is the strength of my life and my portion forever. He is the creator of the ends of the earth. He holds my future in his hands. And not just my future for the next 30 minutes or 30 years, but forever and ever. So I can say to God, you are my hope. In you, I hope all the day long. So be joyful in hope. Be patient in affliction. Be faithful in prayer. Things aren't the way they should be. But one day, they will be. I stood up for the right thing, and the wrong thing happened anyway. 
God wants to do great things through you. But he also wants to do amazing things in you. Nothing that you do for him is ever wasted. Trust his timing and don't lose heart. Healing isn't coming as we prayed. God is still God. And God is still working. My life is a mess. God will never leave you or forsake you. And if you look to him and quit doing some of the things you want to do, you will find this promise true in your life. That he will take this thing that looks like a web and he will make your paths straight. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. And finally, get out from beyond yourself. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Invest in what counts so that your zeal won't quit. Your heart will overflow and you'll sense new freedom in serving the Lord. Zeal. Zeal is the tireless hope I mentioned in my title. In a moment, we will sing a song called Something New. And I hope that as we sing, you'll use it as a time to pray and to ask God if there is anything that we talked about today that God wants you to work on with him. If you feel like you need someone to pray with you, I hope that you'll come down to the front of the sanctuary during the song or after the service is over. We'd love to pray with you, uh, whether it has something to do with this message or if you need prayer for healing or anything else in your heart that is burdening you today. Worship team's going to come as I finish up. Circuit riders are gone as far as I know, but in my high school years, I met a man who was pretty close to one. He went from church to church in our little network of brethren churches, encouraging and training youth pastors and exhorting adults to invest in the junior high and high school kids. He also pushed for adults to get together in small groups for nurture and accountability. He dreamed big dreams, and he pushed our churches, who were mostly small rural churches, to be concerned about inner city people and their problems. And he isn't just talk, he lives it even today. He moved from a small town in Indiana to inner city Philadelphia so he could minister to youth on the streets. It's really an unlikely combination, the rough streets of Philly and this man who's now older, average height, average build. But what a smile on his face and what a sparkle in his eyes. He talks about Jesus and the difference Jesus can make in your life. What a presence he has on the streets near the mission that he helped to found. It's nothing flashy or famous, but all the people around there know where to go for help and for encouragement to be the kind of person that God called them to be. Whenever I read this verse, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord, I think of this man. His name is Ed. And it occurred to me this week as I was preparing for the sermon that Ed's very far from dead, and he's my friend on Facebook, and I really should get a hold of him and find out what he does to keep on going. Here's some of what he told me. My hope comes from my faith since I know that I do not want to become a common Christian. I know where I am going and I have a purpose and plan for my life. So here's your invitation to be uncommon. Embrace this tireless hope, this zeal that comes from serving the Lord. Let it spring up and overflow within you. 
Don't let anything or anyone zap your zeal. Say yes to the Holy Spirit in your life and guard your heart. Be diligent, passionate, and unstoppable. Amen.